I have nothing to do with the patch clamp technique. I'm a theoretician and I have just make models. Um, indeed, I like to start with this picture, which shows a patch clamp recording from a Cerebellar Purkinje cell. So you see this, this glass pipette here, which is filled with a yellow dye. And the glass pipette makes a seal with the membrane of the cell. Miraculously, the membrane and the glass like each other. And then what you do is put some negative pressure inside, so you suck. And you rupture the membrane here, and that whole uh, cytoplasm is suddenly connected to the patch pipette. And any dye inside can diffuse into the cell and visualizes this cell. And so what you can see here is the beautiful structure of the dendritic tree of a cerebellar Purkinje cell. Here's the cell body. This is one main dendrite that comes off it and branches very often. Every few microns or so, there's a branch point. And there's this very, very fine branches where all the synapses are located on it. And I'd like to talk to you about the consequences of this um, very fine cable-like structure tree structure for the electrical properties of the neurons and for what the neurons can do. We've learned this morning from Matt Nolan that all of these neurons are endowed with lots of different channels in their membranes, but we also have to consider the physical relationships imposed by this cable structure on the interaction of the different channels. So that's what we're going to do, and we're going to use models for that mostly. Um, but first, We'll also look at reconstructions of other cells. So here we have another cell that's like the first one. It's a Purkinje cell, this time from a human, uh, drawn by Ramon y Cajal. Um, it's like the uh, rat cell that we've seen before, flat. So it's one flat, very dense network of highly branching dendrites. Here's the cell body. This is the axon, where the signal goes to the next neurons. This here, in contrast, is a pyramidal cell. This is in the neocortex. It's about a millimeter long. It has a cell body here. It has so-called basal dendrites around here, which are coming off the cell body. Then there's the apical dendrite that goes up to the apex of the brain. It's the apical tuft. So this receives inputs from axons that come from other areas in the cortex, horizontal axons here. Um, and there's also branches here that we'll speak about. They are the apical oblique branches. So we have very, very different branching patterns in different cell types in the brain and in different species. For example, that's, that's a Purkinje cell from a fish. Very different from the branching pattern here. And so we'll talk about what the consequences are of these different geometrical structures for the electrical function of those neurons. Of course, there's also the wiring problem of the brain. So it's clear that many of these different geometries are intended to establish different configurations of connectivity in the brain. So for example, this dense dendritic arb of a Purkinje cell allows the Purkinje cell to potentially read out any axon that intersects it. And there's many axons called parallel fibers that intersect this one Purkinje cell. And so it's able, if it wants to, to read out any of those inputs. And this cell is more selective. It will mostly read out inputs arriving here or up here. In between, it won't read out so much. So the morphology has clearly the, the function to allow particular connectivity. But then this particular morphology also has direct consequences for the intrinsic properties of the neurons. So to study and describe intrinsic electrical properties of neurons, we need to consider the properties of this cable-like structure. And we need to consider a little bit the physics of the situation. And so the variables whose relationship we want to describe are the membrane potentials. As we've heard this morning, there's a difference in, in electrical potential between the inside and the outside. Inside normally is negative. And so we want to know, here's the cell membrane, how does the membrane potential, this potential difference, depend on the position? So if you go, go along this membrane, how does it depend on position x and also on time? Because it evolves with time. And then we have two types of currents that can flow here. There's the axial current, which means current flowing along the axis of a cable. And what you see here is this kind of imagined cross-section. And what we will do is kind of we imagine we'll count all the ions that cross this cross-sectional area at a given point x along the cable and at time t. And that's something we have to relate to the voltage. And then there's also the membrane itself <coughs> and its resistance that will be 
um, channels in this membrane, and even in the absence of channels, it's not a perfect isolator. So we'll always have some current flowing across the membrane. And this is the membrane current, again, depending on the position along the cable and on time. So these are the variables, but there's also parameters. There's physical properties of this arrangement which will determine the relationship here. And so among them, who can list some of the parameters that will determine um, the relationship here? So what's, for example, about the property of the intracellular medium? What kind of properties of that are important? So the intracellular medium, as we've learned, contains lots of ions, so mostly potassium ions, but also some other ions. And these ions are mobile, right? And so having mobile charge carriers means that this intracellular medium is Exactly, it's conductive, exactly. So we have the conductivity or resistivity, which is just the reciprocal of it, of the intracellular medium. So basically we want to know if we have a millimeter long piece of cable with a certain cross section, what will be the resistance in ohms? And we get that by multiplying this Ri um, with the length and divide by the cross section. So resistivity. Then we have properties of the membrane. So the membrane, as we just heard, passes current, which means that it also has some conductivity, right? And also has capacity. So we have a high capacity of the membrane, and this is capacity per surface area, kind of specific capacitance. Um, and we have this resistance. This is time surface area. So imagine you have the reciprocal of that. It would be conductance per surface area. It's maybe more intuitive. So if these three parameters, and that's what we have to kind of determine somehow experimentally or fit or assume if you want to predict how particular currents um, yield different voltage uh, distributions across, across space and time. And um, this was first kind of applied to neurons in 1959 by a guy called Will Rawl, who helped um, experimentalists interpret their data. So experimentalists at that time, for the first time, were able to record intracellularly from motor neurons in the spinal cord. So they stuck these glass uh, uh, tubes into the cell, and they injected currents and measured voltages. And they had some difficulty understanding what was happening, and it was Will Rawl who understood that, well, we have to consider when we inject current here, that this current will actually not just go across the local membrane here in the cell body, it will also go along all the axes, it form this axial current, and then only exit through the membrane of the dendrites, and that this is a more complex problem than people thought previously. So this was the first kind of early indication that to describe the electrical properties of neurons, we do need to take into account their structure and then the properties of the membrane and cytoplasm. So what does the solution look like in simple cases? Just to give you an intuition what this thing behaves like. In the simplest cases, we have one electrode that, or one synapse, imagine, um, that injects current at a certain point x, and it does so constantly. So it's a steady state solution. We don't change the membrane potential with time, so the capacitor that would be charged or discharged doesn't change charging state. All that matters is the axial resistance and the membrane resistance. And the equation produces a solution that looks very simple, that the voltage just decays with space with a single exponential as a function of distance from the side where the current enters. So there's a single exponential going to both sides, and the space constant, so kind of, you know, the um, the factor with which you have to multiply the, the space coordinate to get the argument of the exponential, that is dependent on things like the thickness of the cable and axial resistivity and so on. So thin cables cause steeper attenuation of the voltage, as you can see here. So if we move the electrode from this thick part into the thin part, then we see that in the thin part, because the axial resistance is higher, the cross section is smaller, we have the steeper attenuation, which then becomes a, a flat attenuation again as we enter the thick part. So branch points, they have some kind of special um, significance for the way the memory potential spreads. And the ratio between diameters is important as well. Next, we can go to 
more complex structures like real neurons with many, many branch points. And so the Ludic trees have certain properties that are common to most of them, such as that the main dendrites that come off the cell body tend to be quite thick. And then the higher order dendrites tend to be thin and also quite long. And this means that if we inject current here at this point I, the voltage attenuation across this very short but thin piece of dendrite is very, very large because the axial resistance is very large. And all the current that has to enter the cell has to go via this path if the current injection happens here. So lots of attenuation here and then it becomes flatter and flatter as we reach the thicker dendrites. In contrast, if you put the electrodes into the soma, you are in kind of a central location in the cell and you reach the thick dendrites immediately and so your attenuation of voltage is much less. So dendrites are intrinsically asymmetric due to this um, diameter and branching ratio that you always kind of split up into two. And um, we can see this directly. So this is trying to model Purkinje cells. So we've, you'll see in a second, we've measured voltage responses to current injections and made a model so we determine these values, memory resistance, memory capacitance, and intracellular resistivity and we have the morphology, so we can run simulations, numerical simulations of this, and we find that indeed, if we inject current here, the voltage kind of spreads nearly entire, the entire cell, so the control of voltage from the point of view of the soma is very good. If we try to inject current at each of those points here and try to see how well we can control the soma voltage, that's much poorer. If we, you can see here, we drop a little bit, if we put things out in the dendrite. So what was color coded here is the voltage control from the point that was color coded. So if my electrode is here in this very thin one, it will be very poor in controlling the soma. And the asymmetry is also there for the older cell. This is kind of 14 day old, this is 21 day old. But already you can see in the control from the soma that the control has gotten worse. So thick, um, so, so large lenticular trees are harder to control than small lenticular trees. And this is the transient solution. So this is the steady state again with a single exponential. If we have a short pulse of current, then during the pulse, we have this um, situation that looks like this with this kinky edge. But as soon as the current stops, it's a round edge and it becomes like a Gaussian basically. It's like a diffusion equation. So this equation that we have here for voltage as a function of space has the same properties as a diffusion equation for the concentration of some stuff as a function of space and time as well. And the solution of that is a Gaussian function which becomes wider and smaller in amplitude as time increases. So it's kind of a dissipation of a little drop of ink in some glass of water. And we can use this, this time dependent properties, sometimes at least, to infer things about the configuration of the neuron. For example, we can see that as we move a synapse from the cell body out to the finest, thinnest terminal dendrites, then the shape of the synaptic potential, so the shape of the response in voltage that the soma sees when the synapse is active, changes. So it takes much longer to rise and also stays up longer if the synapse has been here and we measure here compared to when we measure where the synapse is. That's very fast. So then reading out experimentally these waveforms, we can kind of extrapolate back where the synapse must have been, at least under some conditions. And we can use this for some information processing. So, or the brain can use this. And this is kind of the first um, very, very direct intuitive demonstrations from 1964 using the first numerical simulation of dendrites um, that dendrites can do some things somewhat unexpected with their inputs. So imagine you have this dendrite here. Here's the cell body where the one is. And you have two synapses that are active at a given time. And you can kind of switch which of the synapses are active in a certain sequence. So you can start with the proximal synapses. So at time A, you have those two active. At time B, those two, then those two, then those two. What happens at the cell body is this response. So it raises very fast because you have this response from the very proximal synapses. And then it kind of stays up because as the response would decay, 
all the other responses kind of come on and keep up the level for a long, long time. In contrast, if you first activate the most distal synapses, then at first nothing happens at all because it takes a long time for this distal response to arrive at the soma. But then, as you activate more and more proximal ones, they tend to sum up at roughly the same time. So the response takes a while to take off, but then it takes off to a higher amplitude than this one. And it also is shorter. So if you imagine that the threshold for an action potential in this neuron is somewhere here, then this sequence of inputs, even though it's the same number of inputs in total, will not lead to an action potential, but this sequence will. And if you imagine also that the synapses are somehow you know, spatially mapped onto the tree, like in a retinotopic fashion, that this thing really is left in the field of view and this thing is right in the field of view, then the single dendrite could discriminate directions. So that's the first demonstration that dendrites could be relevant for the information processing of a neuron. We'll examine that in some more detail. And then it's also, also discovered that dendrites are not just passive. So what we had so far is just ohmic resistances and capacitors. We also have ion channels in them. We have sodium channels, potassium channels in them. And it turns out that they can support action potentials, a bit like an axon, but in a weak way. So the amplitude is decremental. It goes down in amplitude um, and is also a bit wider. This was shown by patching the cell twice. You have a pipette here and a pipette here. And it's the same cell. You fill it with two different dyes. And you can record simultaneously from the soma and the dendrites, and you can see the soma is always first. Soma always makes exponential first. It actually comes from the axon, then invades the soma, and then the dendrites. And so we look at how this depends on the morphology of the cell. And ultimately, what we are after in the lab is to understand how really should we describe the information processing algorithm that the single neuron is using. In, in a big network model of the brain, what should be the algorithm, kind of the replacement for this big question mark that we use for each neuron? And it's likely the answer will be different for different types of neurons, of course. So we'd like to know how we should multiply, add, or whatever, integrate with time the inputs to produce the spike output. And we, we see this kind of as a complementary question to this question, which is what are the functional effective compartments in a neuron? So at what spatial scale should I consider things kind of fine-grained enough in my description to be an accurate description of what's happening? Should I really treat every spine as an individual electrical compartment? We don't know, perhaps. Could I see a whole spine cluster as such, a branch or a whole subtree? So we'll address that and we have kind of descriptions for different levels here. And. Um, there will be four parts for little stories that I'd like to tell you. The first is to come back to the cable equation properties um, and to look at different morphologies and how voltage spreads in them if, for example, we activate synapses. Then we'll come to the action potentials in dendrites and how their propagation depends on morphology. Then in one cell type, we will study the interaction between two kinds of action potentials, sodium action potentials that come from the axon and backpropagate in the dendrites, and calcium extratentials, which are generated locally in the dendrites. And we'll see how they interact and how morphology modifies the interaction. And finally, we'll talk about how very local sodium spikes are made and what are good sites for initiation of local sodium spikes in dendrites. So we go back to Purkinje cell and First, we have to determine those values of resistivity of the cytoplasm, Ri, resi resistance of the membrane, Rm, and capacitance of the membrane. And the way we do it is we inject brief pulses of current, let's say here at the soma. So this is the um, 0.5 millisecond, one nanoamp current pulse. And we get a big voltage response right here at the soma, which is mostly um, characterized by actual artifacts of the amplifier and the pipette, because the pipette has some resistance too. And injecting current across this resistance means that the voltage here is seen by the amplifier is actually very large, as long as the current is flowing. The, the, the amplifier tries to compensate for that, but imperfectly. So you have this kind of undershoot here, and this overshoot. So we shouldn't really use that for fitting. And indeed, we use 
only that part after two milliseconds for fitting. You see, the, the color traces are the data, the black traces are the model fit, and we fit only from this point here. But we also have the second electrode. The second electrode is just recording the voltage, not passing any current, zero current. So the voltage drop across the electrode is also very, very small. So we can trust this voltage recording here, the blue one. And we can actually use it in its entirety for fitting. So we have two locations, and simultaneously, any model that we make of the real neuron, so we reconstruct the cell and place different um, regions in it and assign values for CM, RM, and RI. And of course, at first, the response will be very far off the measured response, but we can adjust the three parameters and we can fit it. And then simultaneously, we should be able to also predict what happens if we inject current here. So again, at the pipette injecting current, we can trust the voltage, the blue one. We can only trust it starting from here. But now the red one isn't injecting anything, so we can trust that the whole time and fit it. And so in this way, we can establish membrane parameters, and then we can use them to make predictions. What does this cell do with its synapses? So here is um, lots of simulations for synapses, one at a time, that move around into the tree. Let's say the synapse is here at this point, and we measure the voltage at the synapse, that's the green trace, and at the soma, that's the red trace here. So you see that the green trace is a bit higher than the red trace. Of course, locally, the voltage is higher. It attenuates as it spreads to the soma. And if you put the synapse here, at this arrow, you have this situation. At the soma, it's still very much the same. It's a bit smaller here, but not much. And at the dendrite, it's much, much higher. And then we go on and repeat the simulation all over the tree, and we plot in color the results. So for example, this here is the rise time of the somatic response, so the 20 to 80% rise time of this. We see this is slower here. That's why this is purple and this is kind of green. So the rise time increases as we go out. But the peak amplitude from baseline to peak doesn't change much, at least as soon as we leave the soma. So as long as we're in the dendrites, this changes by only a factor of two or so. It's very, very constant. So the different synapses, even you know, the rise time is quite different. As far as the amplitude goes, they have about the same amount of say about what happens at the soma. They're democratic. They don't really put these at a disadvantage. And the local amplitude, which is the amplitude of the green trace, that increases very strongly. But as long as we are in the thick main dendrites, the local amplitude is small. This is in contrast to, say, pyramidal cells. It's the same type of simulation in a different morphology now with very similar membrane parameters. What you can see is, for example, that the range here of the amplitudes at the soma vary by more than a factor of 10, when previously they varied by a factor of 2 only. So this is much less democratic. A synapse out here on a basal branch is at a big disadvantage compared to one close to the soma. A synapse up here in an apical tuft has basically no influence at what happens at the soma. The way these synapses can gain influence, we'll see later, is via calcium spikes that are made here. So different morphologies have very different kind of results for how neurons treat their inputs. This one treats different inputs very differently. This one somehow tries to treat all their inputs the same. And the way it does it is to have very short and very thick dendrites with small axial resistance. Right? If you imagine that the intracellular resistivity would be zero, you have lots of ions, it's very conductive, then you can really describe the neuron as one point. Then you have this ideal, simple, integrated fire neuron, for example. And um, as long as we try to achieve that by short and thick dendrites, we are kind of close to that. Even though we can't make the intracellular resistivity zero, it's impossible. We have finite concentrations of ions, and we have always finite resistivity. OK, any questions regarding this part? Yes. Does the capacitance of the membrane vary as you go further out? It's a good question. So the capacitance per membrane area is one of the more constant things in this business. So whereas these values here, the um, Membrane resistance, you can see it can vary about tenfold or more. Also, the intercellular resistivity can vary. This is roughly constant. But what's not constant is things like the density of spines. So in the Purkinje cell, for example, 
you have lots of spines in these thin branches here. But you have very few spines in the thick branches. So that in effect forces you to model that differently. You have to have a different scale factor for membrane area in spines and therefore also a different scale factor for membrane capacitance and membrane resistance. So in this cell it does depend on where you are effectively via the spine density. Any more questions? Okay. So let's go to extra tensions. Um, this is the experimental finding. It's kind of a representation fit of many, many different data from different publications showing that the amplitude of the extra potential as it goes out in the dendrite is decremental in most cells but to a different degree and sometimes not decremental at all. For example, in the neocortical pyramidal cells which I showed you, it is somewhat decremental. So at 400 microns we are down to about 60% of the somatic amplitude. And it's similar in pyramidal cells from hippocampus and in spinal motor neurons. In contrast, in Purkinje cells, it breaks down very quickly and kind of dies out and is effectively very, very small as we go out in dendrites. And in dopamine cells in Sanjay Nigra, the cells that die when you have, have Parkinson's disease, and in mitral cells of the olfactory bulb, it turns out the amplitude is nearly fully maintained. It's like in an axon. So different dendrites in different parts of the cells can have different amplitudes as a function of distance for this. And we'd like to know what's the influence of the morphology of these cells. Of course, there's also influence of different channels. Each of these cells have different channel densities. Um, and so we'll vary both and we'll see what the influence respectively is. First, we'll go for morphology and use a fixed set of channel densities and properties. And that's something that's an experiment we can only do with a simulation. Because in reality, all of these cells do have different channels and densities and we can't do anything about that. But in a simulation, we can artificially give those morphologies that we've reconstructed different channel densities or the same channel densities. So in this case, we gave all of these uh, cells the same channels and densities as a pyramidal cell is thought to have. And in the pyramidal cell, we get this decremental amplitude versus space function, so it goes down to about 60% and then in the end, if we go up here, it breaks down completely, similar to the experiment. But the same channels in the substantia nigra neuron basically have amplitudes that do go down but then kind of go back up towards the end and every dendrite is invaded by the exponential. It doesn't break down like here. In contrast, the very, very short scale, the exponential fails to invade the directory of the Purkinje cell. It just doesn't do it. And so clearly there must be a difference in the morphology causing it because the channels are the same. It's the same recipe for placing the channels. So how robust is that? Is that because we picked just one particular channel density set and only then it works? Well, we can vary that of course and see how robust it is. So this is a plot looking at the exponential amplitude at 200 microns from the soma, the fixed distance to be fair to all the neurons. It has to be short because Purkinje cells are short. We can't go further out. And here is the standard density of sodium channels that we had before. And it leads to some variability in AP amplitude. So in Purkinje cells, it's very low as we expect. And in Nigra cells, it's very high. Um, and in between, so for example, C1 pyramidal cells, it kind of clearly depends on the amplitude conductance density of sodium channels. So for some cells, we can regulate the amplitude of the exponential by changing sodium channel density a bit. For some cells it's impossible. You would have to really, really increase it by a lot to force exponentials to invade it. In Purkinje cells, they are kind of prohibitive for some reason. If you play with the potassium channel density, it's a similar picture. So at the standard sodium channel density, of course, Purkinje cells, regardless of whatever potassium channels we have, won't support exponentials and dopamine neurons always will. But increasing potassium channel density does decrease the amplitude somewhat. So in C1 pyramidal cells, where we know that we have highly modulatable potassium channels, A-type potassium channels, that if you depolarize, get inactivated, and so the availability decreases, then we can see how this leads to regulation of exponential amplitude in C1 cells. That's been described experimentally. And this is a plot where we kind of vary sodium and potassium channel density simultaneously, and we keep the sum constant and we just vary the ratio 
And you see again that it's easy to modulate um, propagation of exponentials in C1 pyramidal cells. It's hard to modulate it in Purkinje cells. It's also hard, but at the other end, it's always there for dopamine neurons. So that leads us to a single variable that we would like to use to describe how easy or how hard a morphology is making it for exponentials to invade them. And we choose this sodium channel density here that leads to full backpropagation. So the density for, for Purkinje cells must be very high. And in different Purkinje cells, here's the error bar, it is very high to get up here. But in different cell types, we need different amounts of the sodium channel density. And in dopamine neurons, not surprisingly, the least amount to force backpropagation. So here's our single number that is an index of how amenable a morphology is for allowing exponentials to backpropagate into it. And then we're going to correlate this with features of the morphology. So first, we're going to also simplify the morphology. Morphology has many parameters, right? Every branch has its diameter and length and so on. So there's a lot of numbers. We like to simplify this. So first, we collapse all the branches into one unbranched cable, but with varying diameter. And we make sure that at each kind of distance from the origin, we have the same input impedance as the real neuron has. So I have to make these things thicker if there's many branches simultaneously. And then we get different shapes of this unbranched cable if we start from different cell types. The substantia nigra neuron gets this kind of, yeah, decrim, you know, uniformly, monotonically decreasing diameter. The pyramidal cell is similar, but there's a little hump here, so it increases again. And the Purkinje cell is very, very different. Not only is it very short, it also has this usually increasing diameter at first. So it starts with the soma here, then a single dendrite that's very thin, and then the diameter explodes, basically. And we'll see what the consequences of this are for electrical function in a second. But first, we'll do some more simple-minded analysis of morphology. For example, we can, we can count the number of branch points in the tree. And we see that this sodium channel density that allows full backpropagation scales, increases with the number of branch points. So something happens at branch points. That's what we can conclude from that. We can also look at the surface area as we go out from the soma. So it turns out in Purkinje cells, the surface area increases very steeply, just as the diameter increases, right? It's related, diameter and surface area. And so surface area probably has to do something with this difference in Purkinje cells. So we can, for example, correlate the slope here of this curve. So it's a very steep increase in surface area, and it's not steep at all for dopamine and pyramidal cells. So if this slope against the sodium channel density threshold, there's a very nice correlation with that slope. So what's happening? Well, ultimately what we found is that if you compute the impedance that the action potential is facing, where it's going towards, and the impedance where it's coming from, so the source region and the destination region, if there's a mismatch between those two, that's a bad thing for the action potential. Basically, if it comes from a high impedance, therefore a small source region, and it has to depolarize and you know, put charge into a low impedance and therefore big sink region, that's what's happening here at the Burkinje cell. It comes from a small and goes to a big region. And so for a sustained distance, we have this high mismatch of the impedance. And that means the exponential is working very hard. So few sodium channels have to depolarize a big membrane area, and that just doesn't work. So you don't depolarize it. You don't activate more sodium channels to come. They have an even harder time to depolarize what's lying ahead and so on. And the exponential just dies out. So this is the best correlation we could get with the sodium channel density threshold. So the only way to rescue, to rescue it is to have so many sodium channels available that they just force it to happen. And you, know, you need a higher density if you increase this impedance mismatch. And you can also look at this from the point of view of the dendrite. So we can make action potentials in dendrites. We can inject current and make a little spike. And we can do this here, here, and here. And then we can study how far this propagates. And it turns out that's also different for different cells. So it propagates hundreds of microns towards the soma in the substantia nigra neuron. It propagates 
less, but also still hundreds of microns in the pyramidal cell. And it's very, very local in the Purkinje cell. So that was just one location each. We can repeat this in many locations and then plot how far we get. So the best location to start from is this branch point. If we're here, we get 400 microns towards the soma. The best location in the pyramidal cell is also somewhere here near the main bifurcation. And there is no best location. They are all bad in the Purkinje cell, but there's many, many of them. So many independent little zones of spiking. And we can also predict from the impedance mismatch, from the point of view of the dritic location for making the spike, um, how, you know, how easy it is to force the spike to go to the soma, so how far we have to increase certain channel density. And it also matches, the correlation is also best um, with the impedance mismatch from the point of view of the dritic site. So we have this relationship between morphology and back propagation of the exponential. We have it across different cell types. We know different cell types do have different channel types as well. So this was kind of um, problematic because we use the same channels in different cell types. Now let's focus on just one cell type where we know that across individual cells the channel types are much more similar and look for effects of morphology on their different properties. And we do this in pyramidal cells. Pyramidal cells have this funny, interesting behavior if they are old enough, so if they are several weeks old in rats and mice. You can record from them, so lab Matthew Larkum, who did these experiments, recorded from them at multiple locations along the soma and the dendrite. Here's just two shown. And he finds the usual behavior if you inject current here. You give the current pulse at the soma, you trigger an action potential in the axon and the soma, and it back propagates. So far, that's what exactly what we know. We can also inject current here. And if we inject enough, that's several nanoamps here, then we trigger this big, long calcium spike. You can see it's a calcium spike by this inflection here. So it's not just an EPSP like this. This would be you know, something that is too small to trigger the calcium spike. And you have just an EPSP. Here, the slope increases again signifying that you've recruited more and more voltage-gated calcium channels that drive up the membrane potential to this level, and then it lasts very long. That tells you it's a calcium spike, not a sodium spike. Also, you can do calcium imaging and so on, and pharmacology. So this is a sodium spike, this is a calcium spike. Now, interestingly, they interact in a nonlinear way. So the threshold for making this guy alone was very high, several nanoamps. But this threshold drops, so the dashed line is the same level here. It drops to about a third if, before we try to initiate it, we trigger an action potential that back propagates. So we can lower the threshold for making this calcium spike by preceding it with an action potential. And we can do this in different cells, and we find that that's different in individual cells. So this cell here didn't reduce the threshold very much, right? So the amount of current you needed is nearly the same as with the dashed line, whereas here it dropped by about 70%. And also the shape looks different. Whereas the somatic AP is very stereotyped, this thing is not. So there's differences between cells. Yes? So while we're talking about nonlinear interactions between IPSPs and, and backpropagating action potentials, in a normal situation, you also have like multiple synaptic inputs arriving simultaneously. Yep. So to what extent? Do these individual synaptic inputs tell you something about what's going on when you receive a whole barrage? Because those interactions will also be nonlinear, right? You have, you'll have one IPSP yeah. spreading and it'll shunt possibly if it activates the yeah, yeah, yeah. channels. Like there's lots of nonlinear interactions. So the amount of current that we use here, this is multiple nanoamps is not made by a single synapse, but it's kind of the equivalent of activating many synapses up here. So you can get this with synaptic stimulation. You stimulate axons here, and you get this same kind of thing. And also you can observe this in vivo. So under normal bombardment, even out now under behavior, people observe these calcium spikes, and they also know that there are sodium spikes, and we know about the interaction. Um, so we know that this happens during the ongoing barrage of inputs. Um, but Astridis is right. So this is kind of a simplified, you know, mechanistic way of triggering it and analyzing it. And in reality, it's more complicated. In reality, 
These current inputs aren't made with pipettes and with rectangular pulses. All of this is made by synaptic inputs around here. If there's enough of them, it triggers the sodium extratensional. And then there's inputs here that come from other cortical areas with axons coming from horizontally from different regions. And if there's enough of them, they might trigger a calcium spike. That's how it really works. So we have morphological differences between the cells and we have these functional differences. So let's ask how much can morphology contribute to this difference? And to do that, we have to have a model that behaves properly. So we have to have a recipe for placing sodium, potassium, calcium, and other channels that makes backpropagating APs, calcium spikes, and this combined event where you have first a backpropagating AP followed by a calcium spike. And this model does it. And it does it robustly so that if we place this recipe for placing the channels, our model, our recipe, into different reconstructed pyramidal cells, we get different degrees of this threshold reduction for the calcium spike. We call that coupling. So one cell initially had this 70% reduction of the threshold that would go about here. And so in different cells, they have different amounts of threshold reduction. And that mirrors very closely the experimentally found distribution of this threshold reduction. Because if you do experiments on these cells, you also find that this threshold reduction varies. So what in the morphology, which is now again the only variable here, we have the same recipe, the same channels, um, only the reconstructions are different. What is it? So we went systematically about this and we analyzed the different morphologies. We did kind of classically um, inspired plots of the number of branches as a function of distance called the Shawl plot. And we modified this to have two variables. So we looked at distance from the soma and simultaneously the distance from the most distal end. So for example, these guys, they are branches in these apical oblique dendrites here. So they are close to the soma, right? They're close to here and close to the most distal end. They are branch points here. And then there's branch points up here, for example. They are far away from the, from the soma and close to the end. And these are these guys and so on. So we have plots like this and we then asked, well, do we have enough of this information? And the way to test that was to accumulate these data for two subsets of our pyramidal cells. We, we grouped them into whether in the simulations they were showing a strong threshold reduction for calcium spikes or a weak one. So we have two classes, functionally defined. For each class, we compile these branch you know, point statistics and you know, dendrite diameters and stuff more than shown here. And then we roll the dice and we draw numbers from these experimentally determined distributions and grow our own individual neuron that kind of matches these dendritic morphology properties. So we synthesize neurons here. And again, we place the same recipe for channels into them and we simulate a threshold reduction. And it indeed turns out that we've you know, had some bias. So there's some things that have 100% threshold reduction, which means there's a calcium spike even without a sodium spike, right? Um, so, no, sorry, the sodium spike immediately triggers a calcium spike that way without any input in the dendrite. So we have some bias, but we have this, this, this difference conserved that neurons that have a morphology that allows coupling to be effective will generate synthetic neurons that also have effective coupling and the opposite for the poor couplers. So we have the information hidden somewhere here. What is it? And so one thing we found was if we look at the number of branch points coming off the apical dendrite here at different distance regions, there's this region here that distinguishes good couplers from bad couplers. So the good couplers, they are the open symbols. They have few branches here. And the bad ones, they have lots of branches here. And that's just the correlation. Having the model allows us to immediately turn this into a causal link because we can modify the model easily. We can, for example, remove branches like this. So if we remove randomly some of those branches, we increase the coupling. If we add them, like the orange one, we decrease it. So clearly there's something about the branches here that influences the coupling very strongly. And the explanation is that basically as the, exponential, the sodium exponential propagates along here to reach the area where calcium channels are and where they could be activated and where the nonlinear interaction could take place, then having lots of branches here constitutes a bigger capacitive load, a bigger sink, a bigger impedance mismatch. 
and it will reduce the amplitude of the sodium X potential as it gets along here. If it reduces it to a point that it cannot activate the calcium channels anymore, then this coupling will decrease. And experimentally, we actually then surprised, we were really surprised that this works because we thought, well, okay, it's such a small effect, very likely any change in sodium channel density can override that. Yes, you would expect all you have to do is place more sodium channels here and you change that back to normal. But the thing is that in fact, somehow it still survives in the experiment. So here this is the experimentally measured coupling that was measured long before, so experiments were done before the model. And um, we subdivide the oblique branches in the real cells into two kinds. Those that are within a distance of 150 microns from the sum of the proximal ones and the more distal ones. And then we plot the percentage of how many proximal obliques there are. And having many proximal obliques implies there's few distal ones, right? So there's few here. And we know that the distal ones are the bad ones. So having few distal obliques means there's high coupling. So it works, surprisingly. Any questions on that part? So the fourth part is about very fast, very local sodium spikes in dendrites. And the motivation is again this big kind of question mark, what's the algorithm that we should substitute for what a single neuron does in the brain? And there's been proposals by Bartlett Mel about what this algorithm should be or could be for different types of neurons. So for pyramidal cells, in this case, a hippocampal pyramidal cell, he's been proposing that we should consider not just the cell body or the axon as a site where this nonlinear decision is taken whether to make an exponential or not, and where the inputs are summed with a certain coefficient according to the attenuation to the soma, and then the decision is taken whether to spike or not, that such decisions can also be taken at a more local level. Ideally, in each local branch, there could be mechanisms like sodium channels, like NMDA receptors, like calcium channels, that also have a threshold or have some strong sigmoidal-like nonlinearity that they don't linearly sum their inputs, but if their inputs exceed a certain threshold, then some mechanism kicks in like a sodium spike, calcium spike, an MBA spike that boosts it and then sends the outcome of this decision to the soma, which again decides whether to make an exponential or not. Or you can have another layer, which is what we just described, which would be this kind of nonlinear multiplicative interaction between the sodium spikes and the calcium spikes. There could be even these three layers. So local sodium spikes here, then this interaction between calcium and sodium spikes, and then the output. So we'd like to look at the conditions for initiating spikes in dendrites. So how should we assign these idealized kind of um, first layer units to different branches in the morphology? So Bartlett Mel, he knows how to do it. He's shown that you know, if he assigns them by hand, he can get a very good match between what the full cell model does and what this simplified two-layer network model does. But can we do this objectively? Can we have a computer assign you know, what would be one such subunit? I'm sorry, can yes. we need that kind of model to integrate some bias if you go from one part to another part? I mean, I understand that when you when you inject a current, it should propagate in both ways, but sometimes uh, because of the, of, the, of the diameter of the dendrite, it should be some bias to go in one way or in another Absolutely, way. yes. Yes, totally. So basically, the current will always flow most easily into thick dendrites and will have a harder time flowing into thin dendrites or short dendrites because the terminations they are closed. The current can't go across it. So the current is stuck. It can't escape. But it can escape along the thick dendrites. And we'll see in a, in a second what the consequences are. So maybe you can ask the question again if what comes now doesn't address it. Yeah. So this is just to show experimentally what the spikes look like and that they are really there. Um, this is injecting current into a dendrite of a pyramidal cell. You see in red the dendritic voltage and in blue the somatic voltage. What happens if you increase the amplitude, you get this local spike. It's the basal dendrite of a layer five pyramidal cell. It's not this calcium spike, it's much shorter. It's not as high as the somatic spikes, but it's not a calcium spike because it's much shorter. 
at the soma, you see only this little kink. And then if you increase the amplitude even more, we have the sodium spike followed by normal extra tensions that then back propagate. Right? So here the soma is first blue, and then the dendrite follows. Here, the dendrite does this in isolation. It's really a local spike. And it's dependent on sodium channels. So if we model this, we kind of proceed in the same style as we proceeded when we looked at the uh, subthreshold um, EPSP amplitudes. We go from one point in the cell to another. We increase the input amplitude. And then we plot in color how much conductance we needed to trigger a spike. And red means the numbers are very low, so it's easy to make a spike. So it means that if we are here in those thin branches, or here in the basals or apical obliques on the tuft, we need very little conductance to make a spike. If we are in the thick or more central regions of the cell, it can be that we need huge, huge conductances to get the spike. So why is that? Well, there's a simple explanation for that. It mostly reflects really directly the, the geometry of the cell and the input impedance of these different locations. Having a thick dendrite means that the input impedance is low. Right? Current has an easy time escaping. So you need a lot of current, a lot of conductance to depolarize to the certain threshold where the spike can start. If you are in a thin or terminal dendrite, then there's not many regions for current to escape. So a small current gets you to the same depolarization, to the same threshold for making the spike. But it's kind of trivial. Let's factor out these different effects of input impedance. Let's try to look at something that's better in reflecting how easy or hard it is to make a spike. And that's the voltage threshold. So now we see that actually those regions that were red have a quite high voltage threshold. So we need to depolarize to levels of, say, minus 20 or may maybe sometimes 0 millivolts to get a spike out. And high voltage threshold implies that if you look at the activation curve of the sodium channels that you heard about this morning, we have to really go all the way up to the activation curve when we recruit all the channels. That's what signifies kind of a difficult location for making a spike. And these are those terminal branches, for example. And they are also some of the central regions, the thick branches. But here in the middle of one of those subtrees, it's orange, which means that the voltage threshold is low. So we need only a small fraction of all the sodium channels that are available to actually get the spike. And that's because in these regions, we can easily activate a whole range in space of sodium channels. So if we go here, we get this entire subtree, basically, and all the sodium channels in it. But then from this subtree, there's not much escape routes for charge to be lost. There's, of course, all the terminations where it cannot get out of. It's captured. And there's just this one thin um, connection to the main dendrite, which is not much of a sink. Right? This is a thin dendrite, so there's a high axial resistance and not much loss. And that's why this is kind of a very good location for making a spike. Similarly, in pyramidal cells, you can see that kind of the outer third of those basal and oblique branches is the best location for making a spike. And indeed, every of these branches kind of seems to be you know, having one, at least if it's long enough. If it's too short, it's connected too well to the main dendrite, and it's lost. But if it's long enough, it can be its little spike generation site. And then once the spike is made, it, it stays localized to this branch. So this plots the surface area invaded by the spike. And red again is small numbers. And it means that in one of those thin branches, the spike is very localized. It doesn't escape beyond this local branch. Similarly here, if you make a spike here, it stays within one of those branches, doesn't invade the soma. And so they are really independent subunits. They don't trigger spikes neighbor, neighboring subunits. If you want to get a spike in the entire cell, you have to go here to the main dendrites. And that's what a particular axon called the climbing fiber, in fact, does in Purkinje cells. So in Purkinje cells, you have two kinds of inputs. You have these 100,000 inputs called parallel fibers that kind of are in parallel and intersecting this dendrite in perpendicularly. And they invade mostly these spiny branchlets, the thin branchlets. And you have one axon that goes along the thick dendrites. And so it strategically goes to where it has to go if it wants to force a spike onto the entire cell, which it, in fact, does. A calcium spike called complex spike. Um, also, in pyramidal cells, if you want to get 
most of the neuron, we have to go here to the soma to, in effect, trigger a backpropagating action tensor. So the morphology does create conditions where individual branches can be their own local subunit that can make its own decision whether to spike or not and then transmit the result of this decision to the soma where it finally um, will lead or not to an exponential. So that confirms basically this model. And so to summarize, um, showing you that differences in dendritic morphologies across cells or in individual cells of one type can help to explain what people have experimentally observed for the backpropagation of action potentials that is different for different cell types, um, the forward propagation of local spikes, and also in pyramidal cells, differences in the interaction between sodium and calcium spikes. So we have seen that some pyramidal cells are very amenable for having a strong interaction and other cells keep them mostly independent. Also, by changing the amount of sodium and potassium channels in a given morphology, we could see that in different morphologies there's a different sensitivity to such changes. So some cells are very robust, they forbid backpropagation basically regardless of what the density of sodium channels is, like Purkinje cells, and see one pyramidal cells, in those very small differences in sodium or potassium channel density mean a big difference in action potential backpropagation. And finally, we've seen that if we look at the fine-grained local spikes, um, it's the morphology that can determine how local they are and how likely it is to make them. Therefore, kind of what a subunit structure would look like uh, in this two-layer model. And if, if this can be used kind of as a parameter to tune the function in the network, this would be a way to do it. So you could grow your neuron to have many apical obliques in the right location, then you could forbid nonlinear interactions between sodium and calcium spikes if you don't want them. And if in another region of cortex you want this logical end between um, top-down inputs and bottom-up inputs, then you have to remove them. And if that's the case, if that's really used, which we don't know, it's just hypothesis, then the morphology of the neurons would be a feature for tuning the function of a neuron, not just the bug that makes life harder and um, makes recordings harder to interpret. Um, I'd like to thank people who I had the pleasure to work with. So backfiring, so the interaction between calcium and sodium spikes, this was done with Andreas Schäfer and Matthew Larkum in Bert Hackmann's lab. And the backpropagating exponentials, they were modeled by Philipp Vetter in Michael Häuser's lab. Thank you.